Chabrim, I'm Stephen Bendener, and you are watching today Institute of Biblical Research, a production of IsraelReturns.com. And I want to share with you guys, I got an email from a friend, uh, a believer in Yeshua, and um, they had stated that not too long ago, the Lord had, had carried them by the Spirit, and... Uh, I can't really say exactly how, I don't quite understand it myself, it's harder to, to just get it in an email, but the, the interesting part was that the Lord showed them the first four books of Ezekiel, and uh, so I began to read those four books there, and as I did, then I continued on and read the next four as well, and when I got to chapter 8, it just really kind of spoke to my heart to share with you. And and even those first four books, very powerful, where God is dealing with Ezekiel early on, uh, calls him a watchman. And many of us were very familiar with the scriptures of him being a watchman and how God requires at his hand that as long as he tells the people of their sins and what they're doing to try to save their souls from, from judgment, then his soul would be spared as well. But if he did not, God would hold their lives at his charge. This morning as I read this, my heart became very heavy, very burdened with the fact of God's requirement, even for us, for watching our, our friends, our neighbors, family members, just plunge headlong into judgment. And what have we done to try to speak to them, to warn them of the impending judgment that is coming? Could we really say from our own hearts that, that our own hearts are clear? Have we done everything we can to try to win people to Christ? At any point, as I got to chapter 8, it really struck home for me because it deals with Israel, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But it also spoke volumes as well when we think about the, the Christians of today, because the Christians of today are grafted in. The nations are grafted in to the same root, which is Christ. It is Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the root and, we're, and the vine. We are the branches of that tree that were grafted in, the Gentiles being grafted into this tree. And our lives, it's important that our lives reflect Christ in every way. And for those that don't know him, we must do all we can to win as many souls as we possibly can. So anyway, I wanted to share with you some things that are that, that God says to Ezekiel here in chapter 8. And I'll begin with the fifth verse. In the fourth verse, he says, Behold, the glory of, the, of, of God of Israel was there according to, uh, to the vision, and I saw uh, in the plain... Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now um, the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes in the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here that I should go afar off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And the first thing that really got my heart there was the fact that he shows to Ezekiel, it's like a spirit of jealousy that was upon the house of Israel. And it was so bad that God had gone far away from his own sanctuary. Now, we have to remember this. As, as Christian believers, the human heart is the sanctuary and where God is to reside. So as I read to you these sins that Israel was committing against God, we must also examine our own hearts, our own lives to see, are we... Are we grieving the Spirit of God to, to not dwell in our own hearts because of the acts as it was with Israel? We have to remember, the Scripture says in Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Yeshua is the same. He does not change. Even God's divine name, the yod heh vav -Hey, it is made from three different, you can tell, or let me say, you can take it three different ways. It means that he was, he will be, and he shall ever be. Just from the yod heh vav -Hey. So we go on and read and continue. And he brought me, verse 7, uh, to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. I, I just begin to imagine these things as, as I'm reading it, picturing it in my mind. He's, he's in the temple. He's in different places within the temple itself at the time. Uh, in, in this case here, he tells him, kind of like if you're standing at the wailing wall, so to speak, just begin to dig into the wall. It's like the stone had become soft, and he, and he dug, and he finds a door, and he opens the door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men, King James says, of the ancients. It's translated elders is another way you could translate that. Of the house of Israel. Seventy elders of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients, or what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery, in other words, in his imaginary mind. See, God searches the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And as God was looking upon the house of Israel, even as their thoughts, it's like it was back in the days when God was ready to destroy the world at the Andalusian destruction. God said that the, 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 the very imagination of, the, of man's heart was continually evil. And it was as if God was taking Ezekiel to show him what it was like and he uses the temple as the example of where it's at because the human body is supposed to be like the temple of God. In fact, Rabbi Orly stated, that he said the, the temple itself was laid out like the human body. The Holy of Holies is where the human heart would sit in a, in a person. But in our minds and in our heads, what are we thinking about daily? Is our minds on Christ? Is our minds in thought and meditation? He says to Joshua, he says, meditate upon my word day and night. Meditate on it day and night. You know, if our minds and our thoughts are upon Yahshua day and night, then there would be no place for Satan to put thoughts in there. It's time that we have a repentance before God and, and cleanse ourselves, make ourselves ready for Him. But in the case of the house of Israel, as it is today, you know, what are we imagining in our hearts? In Israel, He saw every kind of unclean thing and then He says they're burning incense to all these things. It becomes worship. It becomes a God. You can make anything a God. Your car could become your God. Your girlfriend could, could become your God. Every woman that walks down the street could become your God. So many other things. Anything that we exalt above the word of God is a God to us. You can make your body your God. There are people that are so consumed with making themselves 
perfect health, perfect young men exercise and, and, and try to build great big muscles and stuff. And the Bible says bodily exercise profiteth a little. I'm not saying that it's not good to eat good things and to be in good health, but I'm talking about there comes a time where people, and I've seen it, where they make their own flesh their God. Meditate day and night in his word. Let me continue on here with you. Then he says, in, in, uh, as he goes on, for they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Then he says in verse 13, he said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz, you have to see, in, in the time of Ezekiel, was a Phoenician god. It is believed that she was a god of fertility, much like that of Diana or Artemis, as uh, Paul writes about in the book of Acts. Um, chapter 19, by the way, if you want to look that up, uh, different, different translations render the name differently. It's either Diana or Artemis, one or the other. But she was, uh, among others, she was worshipped as a fertility god uh, in the days of, of Paul, in the days of Yeshua. And, and, and it was believed that if women uh, didn't, or, or, the, or the husbands were to go and to worship and, and to go to sex orgies and everything and to worship this God and, and participate in these such filthy acts in order to keep their wives alive. And if they didn't do it, their wives might die during childbearing. That's why Paul says, you know, that uh, when he speaks about you shall... Uh, that you're not saved by child, or you shall be saved in child, safe in childbearing, not saved. They translate that wrong. People say that things is saved. Like, like since when does a woman receive salvation through bearing children? It makes no sense. It's totally contrary to the word of God. If, if that's the case, then the blood of Jesus Christ is not sufficient. And we know that's a lie. But he says you will be safe in your childbearing. Paul was letting the women know, don't worry, you don't have to worry about this. That's another subject altogether, but just trying to give you an idea. And so here it was, the women of, of the time of Ezekiel, they were turning to the goddess of Tammuz, and not to the God of Israel. This was Jewish women. You see, God is no respecter of person, man or woman. He is a jealous God and he, and, 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 and he is insistent upon our worship to be fully unto him and to him alone. And he is worthy of such worship. Let's move on to verse 15. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this? O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than these. A greater abomination than the women looking at Tammuz, a greater abomination than the elders of Israel with them with their imaginary thoughts in their mind, a greater abomination than the jealousies that were going on. O son of man, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abomination than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord. The inner court. I mean, it's the place where the priests go. Between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. And their faces toward the sun. S-U-N. Excuse me, toward the east. I got ahead of myself. The sun is what they're is going to speak of. And they worshipped the sun toward the east. D does anybody remember historically the worship of the sun god is what they did, the pharaohs of Egypt. There is, and of course, this this worship of the sun god in ancient Egypt 
carried over into Rome. In fact, in the um, uh, or around 293 or so, or uh, give or take some years there, there's an ancient coin that that that, is, that has been dis that was discovered uh, in Rome, and on the reverse side of it is the sun god in a chariot with four horses. And you can go to the Vatican, and in one of the tombs there, that same god, same sun god in the chariot with the four horses is there. The two of the horses were knocked out when they were making a new, new tunnel into, the, uh, into one of the tombs there. And of course, I share with you right here on the video now, you can see in the, in, in the Catholic churches throughout Europe here, it is evident that the sun is the God that is worshipped. Behind every image they have, whether it be Mary, whether it be Jesus, whether, whether it be the saints or the popes or whatever, they have the sun in behind it. It's, it's amazing. It's absolutely everywhere. The worship of the sun god is in Rome as it is with Pharaoh. And we see here, these were, this was in the inner court. The inner court was not a place for the everyday Jewish person. This is where the priest went. And he says right here, at the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I jumped back too far. Sorry about that. And brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. Do you realize this is what the Muslim people do? They always turn their back to where the temple of God stood and pray. No Muslim will ever pray facing where the temple of God once stood on the Temple Mount. When the children of Israel, in this case here, the religious leaders, the priests and rabbis turn their back on the temple and turn it towards the east to worship the sun. You know, history is only repeating itself. Now the leaders of Israel, both political and religious rabbis, they go right to Rome, the chief seat of where the sun god is worshipped today. And they turn their back on God. I wonder why God was angry with Israel and he says, you trust in the shadow of Egypt. It's exactly what they're doing. No wonder why um, in the book of um, Ezra, Ezra the scribe, he finds out they're getting ready to build the second temple. They were all excited. And then it was brought to his attention that the Levites, the priest, had married in among the daughters of Balaam as well as the political leaders of his day. And he put on sackcloth and ashes and he wept until the evening sacrifice. And he cried out unto God, what to do? And the Bible says that it was chief among them were the rabbis and the political leaders of that day. And he demanded of them to divorce them. And it was a hard thing because many of them had children by them. You see, years ago for Israel, like Ezekiel, he was put on his side for so many days to represent the sins of Israel, the iniquities of Israel, and he had to pay for their iniquity as well as the house of Judah. And God put him on his side and put bands around him and made him eat cow dung mixed with his, with his uh, lentils to make cakes with and to drink his water in the sight of Israel to show them their sins. 
And back in these days when the children of Israel had intermarried in amongst the Babylonian women, it was so hard, no doubt. They, I'm sure they loved their wives. But you see, it was a type. God was trying to foreshadow, not trying, God was foreshadowing in their lives what would happen in the day we're living in now. Just like when God put in his law about the stoning for adultery. It's not just a prostitute. The prostitute is man and woman. They're both to be killed. When the rabbis of Jesus' day brought out the, the woman and said, we've caught her in the very act of adultery. Where was the man at? Why didn't they drag him out as well? If you caught, him, caught her in the act, why didn't you bring him with her? What was he? Was he somebody that had a greater uh, privilege and was able to walk away freely, no problem? He wasn't brought there, though, was he? But even that was a type as well because God, he had a law of stoning when two were caught into it, the very act of adultery. Both man and woman were to be stoned. In this case here, it represents the church. The Christian believers, they'd rather to be in true and loyal to Christ Jesus as your God, as your Savior, as your all in all. You'd rather have Satan for a lover. I'm not speaking to you guys necessarily, but you never know who might be listening. You, you, you'd rather have Satan as your lover and you try to hold Christ with one hand and the devil with the other hand. You cannot serve two masters for God said either you will love one and hate the other. And you know that. In Israel, my brethren in Israel, let me say this to you even now. Let me warn you in the name of the Lord. This covenant you make with the Vatican is the same problem that our forefathers had when they married the daughters of Balaam. When Ezra had to deal with it. When the Bible speaks about in Daniel that you'll break that covenant in the midst of the week, that is what the covenant will be broken about. It'll be that you will have to break the covenant with Rome. That's who you signed the covenant with. The Palestinian people, it's just a little puppet, it's a little sideshow. No wonder there's a struggle in the government now. Those that support and back Shimon Perez want to sign in with the Vatican. You want to follow the son of Ahab right along with it. It's not what God wants. God wants you to separate from that nonsense. And you see in Ezekiel's writings right here, you've turned your back on God and you're worshiping the son. When you turn your hand to the Vatican, you are guilty of son worship. You're guilty of serving the gods of Balaam. With Israel, there's space to repent, just as it is with the Gentile people, the nations, the Christians that have gotten tied up in the same thing. Israel, God commanded you in the book of Revelation chapter, uh, I think it's 18 verse 4, as well as in the very prophets of Ezekiel, they've said the same thing, come out of her, my people. Be not partakers of her sins or her plagues because the two witnesses will bring the plagues upon them. I love you tremendously. In closing, I just want to say thank you for those of you that support this ministry. We do need your help. Just to remind you, because there may be some of that are try, that try to send love gifts to America, to our address in America. We no longer have an address in America. We have moved overseas. We spend a great deal of our time in Israel, but we still have not settled into a home as of yet. And even so, we will not be able to ship our belongings here. The cost to do so with if you, if you send it to Israel, 
the taxes and the fees and stuff plus the shipping is far more than what it would be to, worth shipping the, the furniture that we have. Um, the same is with Europe. It's still the same problem. So we have to totally start over. And if the Lord lays it on your heart to help us in doing that, because solely our duty is to serve the people of God and to try to bring the gospel to both Jew and Gentile alike. The Lord has led us to speak in areas and we go freely. Uh, we will be uh, 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 November, like two weeks from now, we will be in Kosice, Slovakia, uh, also, later in that month, we will be in uh, uh, Denmark as well, speaking in Denmark. As soon as we can, we'll get the information to you where. Uh, be in Israel as well, again this month as well. Uh, I'm going back and forth. I'm in Israel, in, in Europe. We're trying to do all we can to bring the gospel of Yeshua to as many as we possibly can. And you, your help in this, you are a valued partner in what we are doing. You can still give securely online at IsraelReturns.com. Uh, Any place on there, you'll see a donate button there that you can donate there. Uh, and I, if you are wanting to send a, a, a gift but not online, email me at IsraelReturns at AOL.com. Or there's also a, a contact button on our website, IsraelReturns.com. You can uh, just write to us there, and then we can tell you how you could do it if you prefer to send by check. Anyway, we thank you. God bless you. Pray for us. We desperately need your prayers, and thank you so much for your love and your thoughtful prayers for us and your support that you give our, us and our family in this work of God. God bless you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Good night.